Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Aretha Lafayette, Program Manager for Research Education Program Development and Outreach in the Office of Research and Innovation, and I will serve as your session MC for today's discussion. Allow me to introduce our presenter, Michelle Frank. After successfully securing funding from the American Heart Association as a graduate student and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Michelle transitioned from the benchtop to the laptop to become a grants consultant. Michelle has over 10 years of experience helping clients develop competitive grants over a broad spectrum of innovation. Michelle focuses on providing in-depth review, revision, and consultation to improve the alignment and competitiveness of faculty proposals targeting a range of mechanisms for NSF, NIH, DOD, DOE, USDA, Spencer Foundation, and much more. Thank you for joining us today, Michelle. You have the virtual floor. Thank you very much for that introduction, Aretha, and thanks to all of the great folks at um, UTD for coordinating this webinar today. And thanks to all of you for joining today's live event. A few logistics before we get started. Our presentation is slated to run about an hour, including some time for questions at the end. If a question comes up during the presentation, feel free to enter it in the chat box and we'll get to them during the Q&A. And a recording of today's session along with the slide deck will be made available after the presentation. And Aretha already covered much of this information already, but I will just tell you in addition, um, a few of my favorite things are hiking, cooking and blogging about cooking and home brewing. And you can also follow me on not Twitter at, at e Michelle Frank GC. Okay, let's look at today's topics. We're going to talk about four different areas today. We'll start by debunking some myths about career related to success rates, eligibility, timing, and other related details. Designing a competitive project, what the NSF wants to fund, and what some of the key components of a career proposal are in order to be competitive. Thinking of your career project in the larger context of your overall career tra trajectory. And then we'll also look at using the project summary as a tool for outreach to program officers. Next, we'll look at writing your project description. We'll go over our recommended outline and drill down into each section pausing on the education and outreach section to discuss trends for these activities and what good and bad integration looks like. And then we'll talk about what happens after you submit, including the NSF review process, and finally leaving you with some valuable resources. Now let's debunk a few of those myths about the career program. The first one is that success rates for NSF career are much worse than those for traditional investigator initiated projects. The idea being, why should you waste your time on a career application when you could have better success elsewhere? But the reality is that rates in other programs are higher, but that includes all types of proposals. And these are not only investigator initiated research projects, but also programmatic opportunities and programs that don't go through traditional peer review. So what's hidden in this graph is that success rates are comparable or in a few cases even better um, for career awards. The second myth is that everyone applies for an NSF career award. So you're unlikely to be successful or competitive. Well, the reality is that the NSF receives in the range of 2,800 to 3,000 proposals and makes awards for around 20 to 25% of these, depending on the area. That's less on average than one applicant per U.S. university. And we know that many institutions like yours will have several applications, but your competitiveness here is really based on the strengths of your work and what you're proposing to do, along with your pot potential as an investigator and educator. So you should not be thinking of this as a hopeless attempt. We also talk with a lot of faculty who feel like they should apply immediately as part of their first year effort, or that career is intended as a starter award for NSF. The reality is that people who have already had other funding from NSF have a much better success rate. 
one in six are funded as new PIs compared to one in four successful PIs who have previously received NSF funding. And finally, our last myth is to debunk the idea that all research proposals must be hypothesis driven in order for NSF to fund them. The reality is that research need not be hypothesis driven in order to be fundable. Although this is not to say that some reviewers have not historically favored hypothesis driven research. In fact, the NSF says that there are four different ways to formulate your research objectives that are completely acceptable. And this comes directly from an NSF program officer. The first one is the only one here that is hypothesis driven, but there are three others that actually are not. Um, clearly, if your research objective is to test a certain hypothesis, it's hypothesis driven, but these other formulations are also completely reasonable. Might measure a parameter with a certain accuracy or prove some theorem or conjecture. Maybe you're applying a method from one disciplinary area to solve a problem in a different disciplinary area. And then finally, it's important to remember that a lot of funded research at NSF is actually hypothesis generating. It's basic research that's exploring unknown. Um, and all of these are reasonable approaches. Let's now talk about steps you can take toward des designing a competitive career project. As you prepare to be competitive for career, it's critical to understand what the NSF wants to support through this program. And that's the multifaceted full picture of the teacher scholar. I just want to reflect on two important statements in the career solicitation, which I've included here for your reference. The first is successful PIs will propose creative, effective research and education plans developed within the context of the mission, goals, and resources of their organizations, while building a firm foundation for a lifetime of contributions to research, education, and their integration. So this statement is getting at the fact that NSF is looking for PIs who are grounded and connected to their institutions. And the second statement, Effective integration of research and education generates a synergy in which the process of discovery stimulates learning and assures that the findings and methods of research and education are quickly and effectively communicated in a broader context and to a large audience. This statement means that balance and integration of a research and education plan for a successful career represent the foundation that NSF wants to support for a lifetime of contributions to science and teaching. And then the integration of these two elements is intended to stimulate learning, dis dissemination, and broader impact. So that it's the transfer of that knowledge gained. Now let's discuss what a career application should do. In a typical NSF program, the product is the actual research work and how it is affecting your field or society. You are the producer of that work. So your background, your experience, your access to resources, it's all important. But in reality, you as the PI conducting this research could be interchangeable with another PI. Whereas with NSF career, the product is really your career. NSF is investing in that career and helping awardees to get a head start on making impact. After a career award, you're more likely to come back and receive additional NSF funding multiple times in the future, both for research and for education and outreach. Because it is focused on you as the applicant and the idea of advancing your career, you are both the one doing the work and the one being advanced. So what does this mean for you as an applicant? If you're looking at research funding, reviewers typically want to see why the work is worth investing in. You're saying, here's why we might have a big impact. You might be telling them about your background and your research plan, or look at all of these resources I have access to in order to make this happen. But in NSF career, you're telling NSF why your career is worth investing in. Your long-term goal is to do this exciting thing. And by funding this project, NSF will advance that long-term goal. And here's the major impact it can possibly have in the future. Reviewers are looking at your background and resources. They want to see that you have a five-year plan that's going to put you on a longer-term success pathway beyond the project duration 
in the context of your overall impactful career. So clearly, you're selling yourself from a different angle for the career competition than would be the case for a normal research funding mechanism. And you're thinking of the project in the larger context of your overall career trajectory. So let's think about that last statement a little more. It's important that you think about how your career award will be embedded in your long-term plans, because reviewers will be investing in your long-term career, not simply the five-year project duration. So we think about NSF career in the context of your faculty career timeline. You've done your training, you've started your early career, and you're demonstrating, hopefully, productivity through publications, preliminary data, and then hopefully you start an NSF career project. And this provides a strong foundation for your middle career. And then in your late career, you'll hopefully obtain additional NSF funding for research and education. So our general guidance is to place your career project in the context of the next 10 years of your research and education and outreach program, showing how the proposed work is going to be a stepping stone to additional meritorious research and impactful education and outreach. We encourage faculty to wait at least two years to get an understanding of what your institution has to offer in terms of resources, to build collaborations, and to distance yourself from your mentor's work and your training period. Plus, it gives a chance for you to demonstrate outreach and education experiences and an opportunity to generate relevant new publications as an independent investigator. Reviewers are looking for all of those things. So they often might say that, yes, you're a first year faculty applicant, you do have a great research project, but we are not convinced that you're ready for this. But we do recommend that you apply early enough to use all three chances to submit to career. You have three opportunities to submit. And for the second submission, the odds are um, more in your favor that you'll be successful. And then it drops back down with the third submission. And the reason for this, is that after the first submission, you have feedback from the reviewers, you have an opportunity to address, address those critiques, and you might even have additional preliminary data. The odds are that reviewers will respond favorably, and so then you're more likely to be funded. And another reason is that many institutions simply require that their faculty apply to career, but if their proposal is not funded after the first time, they won't pursue it further because they met their institutional requirement and they can check that box. So if you're a second time applicant, you have a bit of, a, of an advantage here. And then it does, your odds of success do drop for the third submission overall. This is what we've seen um, from many review cycles. And um, it, it could be related to the fact that some people have been submitting to the wrong area or they've been unable to address critical um, concerns about their project. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't reapply for that third opportunity. You absolutely should, but we want you to be aware of these trends. And then we want you to focus on building a plan that really, really highlights your strengths, describes why you're the right person to invest in, and then provides a clear path that demonstrates how your proposed work will lead to future funding. Once you're going to decide, once you decide to submit a career application for the upcoming cycle, this is a general timeline that we suggest. Um, obviously, obviously, you want to um, engage your department chair and your office of research and in innovation as soon as possible, and reach out to program officers. Um, and, and career, the career program is a, is one that actually does emphasize. Um, PO outreach, and we'll talk about this more in just a few slides. And so again, this is a general outline. So even though you are here, you can absolutely still catch up on the steps that we suggest. But that's a question that you do need to ask yourself. Do I have the time to submit my best work this year? So let's drill down into PO outreach a bit more. The career solicitation says more than once, that PIs are encouraged to contact the program officer before submitting a proposal. However, and I have an asterisk here for a reason, we know from previous cycles that it's practically not worth submitting a career proposal at all unless you've had that initial conversation. On the whole, POs are eager to help you succeed, although there are certainly exceptions, but they should want to help you succeed because ultimately they are responsible for the portfolio of projects 
that are funded in their area. And so they're looking for additional high impact, high quality science that advance their mission and goals. The other part, and this is important to know about NSF, the program officer is the person who runs the entire review process and identifies the reviewers. If the review includes a panel discussion, they are there following that discussion as it unfolds and taking the recommendations from those reviewers for funding to the director. And then once your project is funded, hopefully, fingers crossed, they are the individuals maintaining that relationship with you, maybe modifying the budget, um, the timeline, et cetera. This person has a great deal of insight into your project. And so it's critical to manage that relationship from the beginning. And then finally, you increase your chances of, of being successful. In most years, the career program has far more applications recommended for funding than can actually be funded. So you can be certain that the program officer will take into account whether or not they've spoken to you before, whether or not they know you and your project or you as a researcher. So let's talk about the best way to do that PO outreach. And that's with a project summary. Um, this is the attachment that reviewers use to prioritize proposals that they're responsible for, but it, it can also double as a concept paper. So keep this in mind as you create your project summary for this initial conversation. It is not the same thing as an abstract. NSF will ask for an abstract later during the funding process if you're being considered for an award. When you submit your application, the project summary cannot exceed one page. The three sections required for the summary include the overview, where you describe your activities, objectives, and methods, intellectual merit, which relates to the knowledge that will be created through your project, along with the impact on your field, and then broader impact, which details the impact that your successfully executed career award would have on society and NSF's goals. Let's look a bit more closely at these three sections. First, the overview. We recommend that you spend about half a page here because this is where you state the problem and help the PO quickly understand why it's important. It can be a brief sentence about the scope of the problem, like economic implications and that sort of thing. And then it provides a high level summary of any hypotheses, if your research is hypothesis driven, your objectives and your methods. So ultimately, the overview should provide the context for your proposed work and kind of a project in a nutshell summary of what you plan to do and how you'll do it. Now, intellectual merit summarizes the project's potential to advance knowledge in your field or in multiple fields. Ideally, from that context that you've just given in the overview, the PO should be able to recognize that the project you're proposing represents a logical next step in the field, or that an important project problem that has held the field back would be solved. So in essence, intellectual merit is why researchers in your field should care about your project and agree that it merits federal funding. And then finally, broader impacts presents the potential of your project to benefit society and contribute to achieving certain societal outcomes that NSF has identified. But essentially, broader impacts go beyond the research itself to your lab, your institution, your community and region, outward and outward to benefiting society at large. So these broader impacts are why everyone else should care about your project and agree that it's deserving of funding. And by everyone else, we're referring to the lay public. Here is a format that we generally recommend for outreach emails. Um, it has prompts for critical information that you should include. And again, you're going to receive this deck, so I won't read this to you, but this is here for your reference. Now, when you get that conversation with the program officer, here are some tips that we recommend. Be personable, but be professional in tone. Remember again that you are the product that NSF will invest in. So as difficult as this, as this is, um, try and be yourself. Convey excitement about your project. And this excitement should come across both in terms of your research and your education and outreach. And with that in mind, it's important that you propose education and outreach activities that are exciting to you and that will keep you excited for five years and beyond. Ready to discuss the broader impacts of your project. 
remember that these can result from your research and from your education and outreach activities. So think of the holistic package. And always listen. The program officer can have a lot of insight, um, typically from numerous submission cycles and review summaries. They know what the sticking points are, typically for reviewers, and what can get reviewers excited. Take notes during the call so that you can review them later in a less charged frame of mind. And then always follow up with a thank you email that specifically references your call in the subject line. Let's turn our attention now to writing the, what we call the meat and potatoes of the career application. For the next several minutes, we're going to drill down into writing the career project description. This is the 15 pages of critical space that you have to convince reviewers why you are worthy of a career award and show them well-integrated research and education plans. This is a general suggested outline for the project description. It's based on merit review criteria, numerous cycles of feedback from reviewers and program officers, and best practices gleaned from winning proposals. And remember that there is a 15 page limit. As you write, keep in mind that reviewers want to know what you want to do, why you want to do it, how you plan to do it, how you will know if you succeed, and what benefits will result if you're successful. Now let's look at each of these sections. The introduction. Remember that you do have a project summary that is separate from the project description that includes an overview, a section of on intellectual merit, and a section on broader impacts. The introduction will repeat some of that content. Um, for example, here we have the purpose of the proposed project, um, your research and education and outreach objectives, the context for your project or background summary, the setting, meaning your institution and any research sites, a concise summary of the research approach along with the education and outreach activities, and a summary of the broader impacts. And the reason for including the introduction is because some re reviewers will read the project summary as a means to initially sort applications into areas of interest or to prioritize by their level of enthusiasm. So if they do it that way, when they come back to work on the actual proposals, they may have forgotten the details and they may not reread the project summary. So it's a good idea to give them a good recap. And over here, I have an example snippet um, from a publicly available introduction to illustrate what your introduction could look like. And again, you'll receive a copy of these slides, so I'm not going to read these snippets to you. They're just here for your reference with underlining to highlight the critical portions. Let's chat about a brief section on your career goals and strengths. After you introduce your application, take some time and space to walk to talk through about um, what you hope to achieve, why you're the right person to invest in, what your strengths are, your publication record, and what you're looking to build in receiving this award. Again, career is unlike a standard research grant because you are the product that NSF is investing in, not just your research. So this section is your opportunity to highlight your training and research and your education-oriented achievements. Be sure to trumpet your successes. Don't be shy. You should talk about your plans in your department and your vision for your overall career. Explain how the proposed work fits into your overall vision and why it is a necessary stepping stone in your development. Remember that career is not intended as a one and done project. It should be setting the stage for additional meritorious research and impactful education activities. And you don't want to rely on reviewers to look at your biographical sketch and infer this information. You, you want it to be right there. Um, walk them through it. And we always encourage using first person tense particularly in career proposals. And the reasoning is that reviewers want to get a sense of who you are as a researcher, educator, and science ambassador. First person is approachable and personable. It's easy to convey a sense of excitement, whereas third person is not conducive to that. Third person is also awkward in all honesty because reviewers are well aware that you were the one who wrote the proposal. 
And now this significance of the proposed project is where you present your literature review. This is typically um, where you include your own preliminary data in addition to prior work that creates a scientific foundation for the work that you propose to do. What you know, what you don't know, what the gaps are, and why it's important to fill those gaps. Make sure that it's clear how your proposed work is distinguished from previous efforts. And do use a logical system of headings and subheadings so that reviewers can easily navigate the proposal. And on the right, you'll see another snippet of a background and significance section um, illustrating what the author references um, for the existing body of literature, identifying weaknesses and leading up to the knowledge gap and the need for the proposed work. And you can choose to include a separate preliminary data section rather than including it in your significance section. Preliminary results are important and even though the solicitation says that they are not required, um, be aware that reviewers will flag the need for preliminary data. And so it will be very important to fill that gap before your next submission. Only present data, <coughs> excuse me, that you collected alone or in collaboration. Only present data that's clearly relevant to the proposed project and make those links explicit. Explain what the data show and how that informed your approach, and also what remains to be answered. So what is that gap in knowledge that you're going to address? Provide sufficient detail for reviewers to assess the value of the data and to demonstrate experience with the methods. And plus, remember that career is setting you up for the first five years of a 10-year research career and beyond. Preliminary data reassures your reviewers that you will make meaningful contributions to your field or domain. And to the right, again, I have another example to illustrate where the author has highlighted a collaboration and described how that preliminary work has now set the stage for the proposed project. Now, turning our attention to the research plan, again, with a clear statement of your goals, research questions, and hypotheses, again, if your work is hypothesis-driven, then include a full methods section for each research question. Describe your rationale, your activities and methods, um, and your expected outcomes. If it's appropriate, describe your planned analyses. For example, if you have statistical plans, you would include them here, along with anything that's necessary, like sample size calculations, maybe biological or technical ref replicates, and that sort of information. Identify any partners who will be involved and point to corresponding letters of collaboration to indicate their commitment. And after you've developed these details, add a brief section that outlines your considerations for potential challenges and alternative solutions to show reviewers that you've anticipated problems that could pop up, but that because you have a backup plan or a workaround, your entire career project won't be derailed. And at the right, this example shows the research question followed by a hypothesis and then the objective for this question. Now turning to the education plan, this will take the same attention to detail. Um, it will follow the same format as your research plan. You should describe your planned outreach and educational activities in detail. Provide your plan's rationale, including target audiences, expected outcomes, and relevance to the research for each activity. Make the connection in order to show integration of research and education. Remember that it's important to provide sufficient detail for reviewers to be convinced that you can accomplish all of the activities that you propose. And remember to identify who the learners are in your educational plan. They don't have to be students. They could be faculty, for example. Just like the research plan, you will want to identify who your partners will be. And likewise, include letters of collaboration to indicate their degree of commitment. Now, I want to point out in the snippet on the right that you can see that the PI makes a connection between the research question, which concerns precipitation in the Andes, by integrating education plans to facilitate activities that will study snowfall in the Andes by engagement of citizen scientists, 
through coursework, using students, and a partnership with a local Andean institution. So this is what would be considered good integration of education and research. So I want to talk about some trends in education and outreach plans. You might consider topic modules to be used in labs and lectures would ideally be shared with others. So consider how you could integrate your research findings into um, these types of modules. And by disseminating them, you are also thinking ahead to how your findings and your modules could also have some potential broader impacts. Reviewers are happy to see continued engagement or expansion of engagement with pre-college students and teachers, especially if you have experience already doing that and you can build on those previous experiences with existing collaborations, documented with letters of collaboration as with everything else. Reviewers are less enthusiastic about you starting something totally from the ground up and this will likely raise questions and concerns about feasibility. Reviewers love to see you collaborate with someone else in order to reach your target group. For example, do you have an existing relationship working with a local community organization or middle, middle school that you could collaborate with um, in order to reach your target audience? <clears throat> and your Office of Research and Innovation includes research education, program development, and outreach. So you can lean on them in order to establish these relationships. Reviewers want to see you leverage novel technologies that enables you to reach groups of people who otherwise might not have been reachable in the past. This idea incorporates citizen science into your research. And just like the previous example that integrated uh, recruitment and training of citizen science participants to make precipitation or observations. And obviously that contributes directly to the research. So that's excellent integration. Integrating research and education describes the reciprocal relationship between the proposed research and education activities and how they might inform each other in your career de development as both an outstanding researcher and edu educator. In a suggested outline, we have a separate section for addressing um, this concern. Another option is to make it a subheading of your education and outreach plan. Your plans should be mutually beneficial they don't necessarily need to be addressed separately, but this is up to you how best to present it. And importantly, your research and education plans need to be substantiated in your um, ancillary supporting documents. So your budget, your facilities and equipment, and your letters of collaboration need to back up what you propose by documenting your resources and commitment to these activities. Now, ultimately ask yourself, how will your research plans impact your educational goals? And in return, how will your educational activities feed back into your research plans? Let's look at some examples. This project, um, we saw some of this example a few slides earlier, involves comparisons of climate between the Appalachian Mountains and the Andes. So what they did was train residents to do data collection in the Andes for the parts of the year when they couldn't be there. This is a great example of citizen science. And then once they had the data, they partnered with a state park to develop a new exhibit. And this is a great example of both integration of research and education, as well as collaborative dissemination. Now in this example, the PI was trying to understand factors that contribute to the marginalization of underrepresented groups in computer science and engineering. So this PI did a couple of things. Um, he used much of the research data that he collected to develop case studies. And then he asked stakeholder groups to critically review the factors that are barriers to engagement, as well as to those that contribute to exclusion. So he facilitated this dual teaching and disseminating process, teaching these groups while also disseminating the findings. And his work went a step further. He used the case study review situations with stakeholders to do additional research, to collect additional research data on attitudes, group dynamics, and willingness to adopt and integrate findings. So they did some of this outreach and actually tested some hypotheses that were either pre-established or generated by the prior work. 
and some of the hypotheses they generated are what they are now testing in their future work. Now let's talk about what not to do um, in terms of integrating your research plan with your educational and um, outreach plans. Reviewers don't want you to propose it, integrate your research results into your labs and lectures unless you have a detailed plan and evidence of prior success. They want to see that detailed plan with learning outcomes and plans for assessment. They don't want to see you propose a new course and especially not without a detailed plan and evidence of, of um, support from your institution. Many reviewers know how much work it takes to plan, to generate new material, or even to get approval from your institution. So without those detailed plans, they're going to say no outright. And even with detailed plans, they're sometimes skeptical. So we generally discourage proposing new courses again, in favor of that idea of um, course modules. Don't just propose to include more undergraduate and graduate students in your research. This is not something that's optional. It's simply expected of tenure track faculty and it's not viewed as innovative. And don't propose a, a brand new summer program. This is a tremendous amount of work. And in recent cycles, NSF has realized that they're not a good return on investment unless you can plug into something that's already existing and add your content to, for example, an existing boot camp. So instead, what the research plan and education plan taken together are supposed to do is to provide you with a roadmap for how this five years of funding will provide the foundation for a career long research and education program. It's important to remember, while this is a five-year award, don't overcommit. Don't bite off more than you can chew. There are so many elements to a successful career project, but convincing reviewers that your goals are achievable and feasible in the time that you have will be key. So I'm leaving you here with, a, with <laughs> an overcommitment avoidance chart, we'll say, with questions that you can ask yourself and avoid being spread too thin or proposing an education plan that reviewers are going to flag as overly ambitious. This is here for your reference, but now I'm moving on to the next section of the project description, which is the evaluation. And notice, note that um, evaluation sections are typically devoted to education and outreach activities, um, along with broader impacts. The research component is evaluated according to the expect, expected outcomes that you should very specifically state for each objective. Your career proposal needs to include formative and summative evaluation approaches. Formative approaches enable you to assess the project as it is implemented and in its initial stages. This helps you understand if any adjustments need to be made, um, if, any, if you need to pivot somewhat in your approach. Now, summative measures reflect on the success of your education and outreach activities at the conclusion of the project so that you can assess whether your envisioned impacts have been realized. Provide details on the specific research questions, your data sources and measures, your analyses, and so on. The plan needs to be clearly connected to measurable outcomes or planned tasks and learning activities. Many career PIs will conduct their own evaluation. This is the most common thing. Um, this requires that you familiarize yourself with NSF expectations for evaluation, but you can absolutely use an external evaluator if that's appropriate. Of course, you want to budget for it and provide a letter of collaboration. You can also use an advisory board for, for evaluation. And I've left you with um, a resource for developing effective evaluation plans at this link. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly touch on the next two sections so that we can get to broader impacts. Dissemination. This section explicitly identif identifies um, the places where you're going to share data, publish your manuscripts, give presentations. What are the specific names of those conferences and journals? If you're proposing to do workshops, talk about those with enough detail so that reviewers know that you're serious and you've thought it through. You're not just saying, oh, I'm going to give workshops. 
um, have actual learning outcomes or goals identified. And then the project timeline. This is a format that we suggest. It's sort of like a Gantt chart. It has quarterly resolution. We include, uh, we recommend including sections for research, education activities, evaluation, and dissemination. And the purpose here is to provide a holistic view of the project for reviewers. And now on to broader impacts. This is a required section of any NSF proposal, and it talks about why society cares about the work that you're proposing to do. The focus of broader impacts is on the potential benefits of the research and the educational outcomes to society and the advancement of desired societal outcomes. Stated differently, the broader impacts highlight the potential contribution of your project to society. It should not be copied and pasted from the project summary. It should include other contributions to society that will accrue from your project beyond simply your education and outreach activities. Although it is true that your education and outreach activities will result in broader impacts with outcomes like broadening part participation in STEM, improving STEM education, engaging the public with STEM, and so on but the activities themselves should be described in a detailed plan, just like your research activities are. Also think about the broader impacts that could result from your research. For example, various industries might be interested, which could be an opportunity for fostering industry partnerships. It might be relevant to policymaking, or maybe it would contribute to the well-being of individuals in society. And I've included some resources at the bottom here that are great for crafting a strong, broader impact section. Now let's talk about results from prior NSF support. And again, this is a required section. The purpose here is to assist reviewers in assessing the quality of the prior work that you've conducted with previous NSF funding. It's your chance to demonstrate the intellectual merit of research you've conducted with NSF support and show your track record of achieving broader impacts with that investment. And this is why we encourage faculty to apply for um, standard NSF grants first, because it's great to have something to, to put here and show your previous track record in terms of intellectual merit and broader impacts. Now this section could be included in the preliminary data section if you would like, um, if that is how you secured the preliminary data upon which you are basing your career project. Um, but otherwise, we recommend that you save it towards the end of the proposal. And even if you have nothing to report, this section absolutely needs to be included um, with a simple statement like, there are no results from prior NSF support to report, um, even NA. But this section is absolutely required. And if it's missing from your application, um, you risk your proposal being returned without review. Now let's talk about what happens after you submit. Review processes vary across directorates and NSF, so let's look at the different models. First, there's the ad hoc plus review panel model, which is used by these directorates with the exception of uh, the Division of Atmospheric uh, Sciences. And then we have the dedicated career panel review, which is used by these directorates. And then finally, MPS uses uh, various review processes de depending on the division. Ad hocs are individual specialists. The panel review is comprised of um, generalists that may have related subject matter expertise. Uh, the dedicated career panel will be comprised of generalists with closely related to distantly related um, expertise. And so the point here is that you do want to write for a mixed audience, um, realizing that not everyone is familiar with your specific field and with the uh, technical jargon um, that you use. Now let's look at who is involved in that review process. Your hands, your I'm sorry, your proposal will be in the hands of a number of people who are going to essentially decide your fate. Um, first is the program officer, um, program director, PD or PO, who at this point probably vaguely remembers who you are and remembers your conversation about your concept. Um, the PO is a general, generalist in the field. They're busy 
Um, they look over all submitted proposals. They run the merit review. They are helpful, but again, they're incredibly busy, so they can be cranky, um, and so on. And then there's the ad hoc reviewer who is recruited by the PO because of their expertise in your field. This reviewer is a technical expert, very busy, reads one proposal in detail, and wants to be doing anything else other than reading your proposal. Um, they are often helpful, but they can also be um, grumpy and come across as brusque in their reviews. And then finally, there's the panelist, who if your proposal advances to the panel review, um, or in cases of directorates that use a panel only process, reads your proposal along with about 50 others. The panelists has broad expertise, so they're general, generalists, and they're very, very, very busy. Um, glasses, eye strain, the works. Um, so the point is, again, that your writing needs to target a mixed audience that has variable degrees of related subject matter expertise. I'd like to take a moment to look at how um, NSF determines scores. Individual reviewers will assign your proposal a score of excellence, very good, good, fair, poor. Um, and typically from what we've seen, only proposals that have a very good, a mix of very good and excellent are going to be fundable. Um, you rarely get the same reviewers. So when you resubmit, um, they're judging you based on a new submission. When NSF uses a panel, the panel makes various recommendations to the program officer. And then these are summarized um, here for your review. Again, this slide is here for your reference. Um, this also illustrates why you want to submit your very, very best work on your first submission. Because from what we have seen, reviews tend to improve only incrementally from one submission to the next. So if you're rated um, good in, in the previous round of review, you might improve to very good. But you clearly don't want to start out with a poor rating or at the panel level, uh, not competitive. So in fact, a rule of thumb across our branch practice is that you should expect three submissions. You hope for two, but shoot for one. And I like to tell PIs to simply expect not to be funded on the first attempt but to think about what you could do in the interim between the first submission and the second to improve your chances of the success the next time. Resubmitting your career gives you a chance to strengthen your track record, both in terms of research and education and outreach. For research, hopefully you can use this additional time to get more preliminary data, publish additional papers. You may also be able to secure other grant funding. And on the education and outreach side, it gives you the opportunity to establish yourself as a mentor and to engage in outreach activities. It's much stronger if you propose outreach to K through 12, if you've actually made those arrangements and done K through 12 outreach in some form in the past, or maybe work with a collaborator who does this. Resubmitting also gives you time to work towards strengthening your proposal for resubmission. You can gather resources, arrange collaborations to strengthen your proposal, make arrangements to figure out the logistics um, for strong education and outreach activities. And you have the opportunity to gain insight from the review process. And then finally, you get the benefit of, in the review pro of going through the review process to address reviewer concerns. Reviews are never fun, but they are full of important information and often nuggets of wisdom so your application can be more competitive next time. So pay careful attention to whatever documents you receive from the program officer. And this is how you should approach a review. Read comments show how your proposal came across. So read them multiple times. And give yourself a break to blow off steam if you need to. Have a glass of wine, go for a walk. Then come back and review the comments with a more objective eye. Looking critically at the proposal from the perspective um, of that reviewer, can you see what their point was, if there is a misunderstanding, consider how it could be avoided in the future. Often it's just a simple matter of needing to revise for clarity. For example, look to see if there are structural or language changes that would help reviewers understand your project. And if all of your reviewers point to the same issues, pay attention because clearly that consensus means it's an especially important issue that you need to address. 
And before you resubmit, really before you even start revising, contact your program officer because they can help you interpret different reviews. If there were disagreements, the PO was there. They saw this unfold, and so they can give you insight. Their input is especially valuable for identifying areas where reviewers were confused. It helps you decide how to revise and submit. Some program officers want you to respond to reviewer comments directly in your proposal, and others don't. And this helps you understand the kinds of project design changes that might be ne needed in order to um, improve your project design. And the PO can give you advice on technical grantsmanship issues that you should address. So finally, I'd like to leave you with um, some keys to success for the career competition. Talk to a PO about your ideas. This is critical. Make sure that they're aligned not only with um, career, that your project is aligned with career and that specific program. To do this, share a concept paper in the form of a project summary. Access Hanover's Grant Learning Center, um, and the information for that is at the end of the deck. Complete a first full draft at least six weeks before the deadline. Get feedback on that draft from at least two people besides your ORI. Work with your grants office, your Office of Research and, and Innovation early and often. Revise, revise, and revise again, and take into account all of the feedback that you get. Submit early in case you've missed something that can be identified by NSF in time for you to correct it. The interval between submissions to work toward increasing your competitiveness, not just in terms of preliminary data, but also um, education and outreach experience. And talk to the PO about your review before you resubmit. And I'm leaving you here with a few resources. Um, this is the 2024 version of the PAPCA that takes effect on May 20th, and so that will apply to um, your career application. <clears throat> and then um, this is the introduction to the Grants Learning Center with the link. Um, and if you have forgotten your referral co code, you can reach out to Aretha and Erin in order to um, get that referral code sent to you. And so with that, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Aretha. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Do we have time for a couple of questions? We absolutely do. Excellent. The first one says, how do I find out which PO to reach out to? Career or program specific? Um, yes. So if you go to the career website, um, just search for NSF Career, and you'll see a, a website that has new dot nsf dot, you know it has new in the in the url and that's the one you want and if you scroll down on that program page there are listings of specific program contacts for career so those are the people that you want to reach out to excellent thank you and we'll put one more question i believe we have time for one more how much should i budget um, that is a great question, and the answer is that it definitely varies by directorate. Um, for example, um, the engineering directorate has a lot more resources than the biology directorate. Um, so you definitely want to have that conversation with a program officer, find out what the floor for the budget is, um, and then also, you know, ask for the amount that you need. There are budget caps, but we commonly see people exceeding budget caps if their um, research and their education and outreach activities merit that. So have the conversation with the program officer and ask permission to exceed the budget cap if that's appropriate, and then save that communication so that um, you can reference it later if needed. Great. Thank you for that answer, Michelle. And now we'll go ahead and close out. Thank you for joining us today, Michelle. We really appreciate you for taking the time out to share this information with us. And I'm sure the audience found great value in the information that you shared. Audience, as always, we thank you for joining us as well. Keep up with the Office of Research and Innovation programs by following us on social media and subscribing to our newsletter. Are you interested in a broader impacts toolkit consultation? During the one-on-one -on -one consultation, a broader impacts professional will walk you through a free toolkit you can use to develop a competitive broader impacts plan for your NSF career proposal. The broader impacts professional can also assist you with developing long-term relationships 
with community partners to satisfy your proposed activity. Please sign up for a consultation using the link in the Q&A chat. For additional questions, reach out to Tiffany Willoughby at tiffany.willoughby at utdallas.edu. And that information was also dropped in the chat. For additional information, please visit the Office of Research and Innovation's Broader Impact website, webpage. The link is, again, in the chat. As always, we value your time and your feedback. So please take a moment to scan the QR code and complete the survey. Thank you for taking valuable time out of your day to spend with us and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.